All right, so our appendages in the skin. And so we have different appendages in the skin that we're gonna walk through. We're gonna talk about our cutaneous glands, um, our glands of our skin. We'll talk about hair and hair follicles. We'll also talk about our nails as well. So let's go through each of those. So the first type of gland I'm gonna walk you through is something called a sudoriferous gland. Um, and this one might be a little weird. It sounds kind of weird. Um, I always remember sudoriferous and I think odoriferous. These are our sweat glands. Whoops, that wasn't supposed to happen. Hang on, let me go back. There we go. Oh, sorry. Technology is awesome when it works. Ah, y'all, this is very frustrating. Hang on. There we go. So those are our sweat glands. Um, we have sweat glands pretty much all over the entire surface of our body. Um, we have about 3 million sweat glands on our bodies. And there's two kinds of sweat glands. We have one type called ecrine. Ecrine sweat glands are glands that you would find on your palms, on the soles of your feet, and on your forehead. You have a ton of these. And typically, these are going to be induced to help regulate your body temperature, bring your temperature down. But they can also be indu induced emotionally. So, you know, you think about it, if you have to get up and give a speech in front of people and that makes you nervous, your palms might get a little sweaty, bottoms of your feet might get a little sweaty, but when you're hot, your forehead a lot of times will get sweaty. Now, one thing I left off right here is, remember, these are merocrine glands. Typically, um, what we find is merocrine glands are our sweat glands. Remember, these are the type of glands we talked about in chapter four where you have a gland, right, with cells in it, a multicellular gland, and those cells produce sweat, stored in vesicles, and those vesicles just sort of burst and release the sweat so it can come out onto the surface of the skin. These are very different from holocrine glands, where the whole cell ruptures, right? Now another kind of sweat gland is an apocrine sweat gland. These are the ones that we find in the axillary region, which armpit, and in the anogenital areas. Y'all can figure that out, right? Anogenital. These are a little different because these not only contain sweat, but they also contain other products like fat, there'll be lipids. There's also gonna be proteins in there. And so sweat by itself, there's really not much there that bacteria want to feed on when it's just water and salt. But if you add lipids and proteins, well, then the bacteria on the surface of your skin are like, yeah, and they go to town and they decompose all those extra products. And that is what causes an odor. And so this is that musty body odor smell that people can get. Again, it's coming from the armpits or the anogenital regions. Now these do not start functioning until we hit puberty. Thank goodness, babies smell good. I love a good baby smell. Um, I don't know how much I would have liked, I would like babies if they smelled like Theo. That would be terrible. So these don't start functioning until we start releasing some sex hormones. These are activated in our bodies during pain. So if you get nervous, if something hurts, or during stress. All right, so pain and stress are typically when those are activated. So again, you know, if you've got to give a speech in front of people, you might sweat from your armpits. Um, I have, I call it white coat syndrome. I get really nervous when I go to the doctor. Um, and I mean, I'll tell you this, I probably shouldn't, but when I was pregnant with my son, I would get so nervous. And my OBGYN, you would have to wear those paper gowns, which those are just cruel. Please just give me like a cloth gown. So I'd get this paper gown and I would sweat profusely from everywhere. And I think it was just my pregnancy hormones and my nerves. And I would literally, when I would stand up, it would be like wet toilet paper stuck to my body. I'd have to peel off all this paper gown. My husband went with me every single time and he would help me peel it off. 
from the back of my legs and from my booty. So yeah, these can get activated during stress, times of stress. Now some other sweat glands that we have, and these are modified glands. We have ceruminous glands. Ceruminous are modified sweat glands. They are found in the ear canal, and they are modified to secrete cerumen, which hopefully you figured out by now, that is earwax. And then we also have mammary glands, right? Mammary glands are modified sweat glands and they are modified to secrete milk. Now, other than our sweat glands, the other kinds of glands that we have are oil glands. And the term sebaceous literally means, ooh, boy, that's terrible, huh? No, I cannot erase that. Can y'all see that? I'll write it again over here. It literally means greasy. So these are our oil glands. And again, remember we talked about how we have merocrine glands and we have holocrine glands. Merocrine glands traditionally are our sweat glands. Holocrine glands are our oil glands. Remember these look different in that you have a multicellular gland where the cells at the bottom are going through mitosis. And as the cells rise to the surface, they get really big and fill up with product, and then they release their product out through this duct. So we're gonna find oil glands pretty much everywhere on the body. Places you don't have oil glands are palms and cells of the feet. Don't have oil glands there because you have to generate friction from those areas. I already cannot open any jars in our house. Um, and so it would be really bad if my palms were oily because it would just be bad. Um, <clears throat> oil glands are there. They're all over our body because they really help to soften our skin. They make it softer. They keep our skin from getting too dry. When your skin gets dry and cracks, you no longer have this continuous barrier. So the last thing your body wants is for your skin to get too dry and crack. So your oil glands are there to keep your skin nice and soft. And what they secrete is called sebum. That's the oily secretion. So I do have a slide here that just walks you through some of the disorders that are associated with your oil glands. The first one over here on the left is something called cradle cap. Has anybody had a baby with cradle cap? Yes. Yes, was it bad? Bad cradle cap, Andrea? Yeah, for my second boy, it was. Was it? Did you have to use like a medicated cream? I did. He just came all the way down to like his eyebrow. Oh no, poor baby. And, um, his, and his hair fell out. <laughs> oh no. Um. So that. So with cradle cap. So if you don't know what it is, um, cradle cap is when the oil glands that are on the scalp become overactive and they produce way too much oil. And what you end up with are, and you can kind of see them on here, you end up with these really scaly patches. Um, my son had it a little bit. Andrea, he did not have it as bad as your son, it doesn't sound like. Um, and it is really tempting as a, I like to pick at things. So like I was really tempted to want to pick these little scabs off, um, but you can't because it makes it worse. Um, the best thing to do for cradle cap is there is a medicated cream if it's bad enough. I would use one of those really soft baby brushes and after I gave him a bath, I would kind of massage his head. Um, and then even adding some extra oil on there. So adding a little baby oil. Um, the reason why these glands are overactive, we don't really know. In babies, oil glands should not be overactive. Think about it. Oil glands on your face are not overactive until you hit puberty right, and you're releasing sex hormones. So in a baby, it's kind of the same concept. They don't have sex hormones yet. They're not being released, so they shouldn't have these overactive glands. Um, now, you all probably heard that if your skin is dry, your oil glands release more oil. And so the best thing you can do is add a little oil so that they can kind of slow down. They're not releasing as much. Um, what a lot of uh, researchers think is that 
The reason babies have overactive oil glands is because they still have those maternal hormones circulating through their body. And this is where they're getting the sex hormones from. Um, usually within two to three months, those hormones are getting broken down. And a lot of times it'll resolve on its own. It'll get better. This one over here on the right, this is a sebaceous cyst. Um, so what you are looking at is the back of somebody's earlobe. Um, a sebaceous cyst is basically just a blocked oil duct. So it's not something, it's not like acne, it's not a pimple, you can't pop it and release um, all of that sebum and the pus that might block up. Instead, this requires surgery. So when you have a sebaceous cyst, they actually have to cut through that cyst, that area, they drain it, and then a lot of times they'll even pack it and let it heal from the inside out. Now, other than our oil glands, we do have a couple of other um, appendages, accessories to our skin that I want to mention, like hair. So we have hair pretty much all over the surface of our bodies, except there's none on your palms, none on the soles of your feet, and none on your lips. And then also, you do not have hair on your, on your nipples um, or on portions of the external genitalia. So those are the areas where you would not have hair. Everywhere else is fair game, right? Like our face, our arms, our legs. Functions of hair does a lot of things. Um, you know, I mentioned to you already that you do have some nerve endings that wrap around hair follicles. So that when your hair moves, these nerve endings are triggered and they tell your brain, oh, the hair is moving. So this is a great way for your body to be able to identify when it's windy outside or if you get a pest or an insect on you. The hair on your scalp is actually really important. Um, it's actually an extra layer of protection, but it also protects against UV rays. Um, my poor sweet husband is losing his hair. And so, um, especially with COVID, I have been cutting my son's hair forever because um, I used to take him to like great clips and they would just jack it up every time. So I'd have to come home and fix it anyway. Um, so I used dog shears to cut my son's hair. <laughs> and my husband at COVID was like, all right, just cut my hair. And so his hair gets cut super short. And um, I cut his hair really, really short. And then we went to the beach. And I forgot to remind him that with his hair so short, he probably needs to put sunscreen on his scalp. And that poor man, he got so sunburnt on the top of his head because the hair on your scalp guards against UV rays, right? Your eyelashes, these are also really important because they keep things from getting into your eyes. They actually shield your eyes. And your nose hairs, um, they help to filter particles. I have been seeing um, on social media, I've been seeing a lot of videos where people are taking like, sticks dipped in wax and shoving them up their nose and they're like waxing their nose please don't do that i mean it looks like it hurts like the dickens not only that number one but number two you need your nose hairs they are really important um, they help to filter particles nose hairs um, end up getting coated in mucus mucus is sticky so as you breathe things in those nose hairs trap particles from getting down into your lungs that's really important. Please don't wax your nose hairs, especially not right now, not with COVID. Y'all need nose hairs. So what is your hair, right? So we know where it is on the body. What is it? Um, it is basically dead keratinized cells, right? So the cells of your hair are dead. Um, the cells are made and produced by your hair follicles, which are embedded down into the dermis. Um, and in your hair, you will have keratin. The keratin in your hair is harder than what we would find in our skin. Um, so it is tougher, it's more durable than what's in the skin. And your hair is made up of the shaft. This is the part coming out that you can see. And then the root. The root is what is embedded down into the skin. Now your hair, if we look at it under a microscope, it has 
three concentric layers to it. Um, it has a medulla. I always remember medulla middle. You are going to see that term so often in anatomy. Um, we have a medulla found in the kidney, right? So it's in the middle of the kidney. A lot of our organs have a medulla, which is always going to be in the middle. Okay, so medulla middle, it is the innermost core of your hair. Around that is the cortex, and then wrapped around the very outside is the cuticle. Okay, so I'm going to come back to this. Are you up? Just kidding. Did y'all lose that or was it just me? Can y'all still see my screen? Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. Well, it went away on the board for some reason. Hang on, let me see if I can get it back. I have no idea what happened. Okay, back on the board. But I don't know what y'all are looking at. You're looking at the sink now. Sorry, this room is brand new. And so, um, there we go. So we have uh, some technical things we got to work out. They want me in here lecturing so that I can be the guinea pig for all of the other ins installations around the college. So we're the guinea pigs. All right, so if we look at this picture, we are looking at the hair, right? We're looking at a, a, a root. And so in yellow, I'm going to just put an arrow on it so you can see it. All those yellow cells right in the middle, that's the um, medulla. So remember, medulla middle. This lighter pink, which you can see on both sides, right? This wraps around the medulla. That's called the cortex. And then on the very outside of your hair, you have this really thin layer. It's just one cell layer thick. You can see it in white. That is the cuticle, okay? So the cuticle is actually responsible for making your hair smooth. There used to be, back when I was growing up, there were Pantene commercials, you know, shampoo commercials, that would show hair under a microscope. And it would always show the cuticle layer where before you used Pantene, the cuticle layer was all like um, broken and flaky. And then after you use Pantene, the cuticle layer was laying down, it was nice and smooth. So it'll make your hair more shiny if the cuticle layer is laying flat. Now we also have our hair follicle, right? So, hang on, there we go. I don't think I like this camera very much. Um, the hair follicle is basically what's embedded down into the skin. And so, Wrapped around your follicle is something called the root sheath. We say that the root sheath actually comes from the epidermis. So I'm going to show you a picture of this. So if we look here at this image of the skin, right, notice what color the epidermis is. It's kind of brown in color. Now you can see the shaft of the hair here, and then as it moves down into the skin, you can see here is that root down in there. Look at the cells that surround that hair root. Notice how they are also brown in color. That's telling you that basically the cells that surround that hair ball are coming from the epidermis. Okay? So we say that the root sheath basically dips down from the epidermis and surrounds the hair ball. So that's the deep end of your hair where it kind of gets nice and big and fat. And again, you do have sensory nerve endings that wrap around that um, root of your hair, wrap around the hair ball. These are the ones that are gonna pick up if your hair moves because of wind or pests. Okay. All right, and then the types of hair that we have in the body. We have different kinds of hair. We have very fine, pale hair called vellus hair. Vellus hair is that really, really pale hair. It's like blonde. We find it in little kids. Usually you'll find it on the arms of little kids. Um, you can also find it in females, like on our arms. If your arm hair is really, really fine and pale, 
Also the hair on our face, ladies, a lot of times that is also Bella's hair. The more coarse hair, like the hair on your head, the hair of your eyebrows, that's called terminal hair. Terminal hair. So this is that more coarse hair that you would find in your eyebrows, your pubic regions, your scalp. Now, hair growth and density. What makes your hair grow faster, right? A, a lot of a lot of women want to know what's going to make my hair thicker and longer, faster. Um, there's a whole bunch of things. One might be nutrition. Um, if you are eating really healthy, um, if you are getting lots of nutrients, then that might cause your hair to grow a little bit faster, um, especially things like getting enough vitamin E, right? That can really help our hair grow faster. But then also hormones. Um, if you have, ladies, if you've ever been pregnant, there is nothing like pregnancy hair. Like your hair will grow so fast and it will be thick and luxurious. Um, but obviously, after you've had your baby, one thing I was not prepared for is um, about six weeks after having my son, I would wash my hair and my hair would fall out literally in clumps. You lose your hair so fast when those hormones start to drop back off. Same thing with nutrition. You know, your hair can grow and be really long and nice and full if you're getting really great nutrients and you're eating really well. If you have a really poor diet or, you know, women who are not eating enough, if you're not consuming enough calories, um, then a lot of times you're going to see it. You're going to see it in your skin. You're going to see it in your hair. So getting good nutrition and also those hormones can play a big role on hair growth. Also, the rate of hair growth can be influenced by other things as well, right? So we have nutrition, we have hormones, other things like your sex your age, right? So males and females, women, because of estrogen, our hair typically grows a little bit faster than men, than a man's hair would grow. But your age can play a big role in that as well. Um, the younger you are, the faster your hair will grow. Um, as you age, your hair gets thinner and it does not grow nearly as quickly. So there's four things right there that can really influence hair growth and density nutrition, hormones, sex, your age. And then the last one, number five, I saved it for last, I'm gonna star it. This one is probably one of the more important ones when we're looking at our bodies. From one body part to another. So, you know, have you ever wondered why your eyebrow hairs are so short? The hair on your head can grow and be really long. This is the same kind of hair, right? It's terminal hair, it's that coarse hair. So why do your eyebrows stay only like, you know, a half inch or an inch in length? And the reason is because the follicles that are growing the eyebrow hairs are only active for about three months. After three months, that follicle will drop the hair and go dormant. Now, all your follicles are not active and dormant at the same time. So it's not like you lose all your eyebrows after three months. Instead, you have other follicles that are becoming active when one goes dormant, right? But if they're only active for three months, that's the longest you can grow that hair. Whereas the hair on your head, these follicles are active for 10 years at a time. And so for 10 years, you can grow your hair and then that follicle will shed the hair it will go dormant, but other follicles might be active. So there's a huge difference in how long the hair can grow, depending on what body part we're looking at. Now we do have some disorders that can affect our hair. So one of them is called hirucitism. This is excessive hairiness. Now, we don't notice this as much in men because testosterone causes men to have more hair anyway. Um, so this is what's going to cause men to have hair on their chest and on their face. Um, but in women, if women have excessive hairiness, if women have hair on their chest or on their face, we notice it, right? So this is caused by excess androgen production. Um, androgens, an example of an androgen. 
is testosterone. Right, so, you know, ladies, we do produce some testosterone, but if you have an overproduction of it, then you're gonna start to see some more male characteristics. Um, like your voice might be a little lower. You might have hair in the male pattern, like on your chest and on your face. Typically, this can be caused by um, ad adrenal gland tumors. Remember, your adrenal glands sit on top of the kidneys. Or it can even be caused by ovarian tumors. So if a woman has this, it's really important that she figure out what is causing this. Another hair disorder is something called alopecia. Alopecia is when the hair, and it can happen in men or women, becomes much thinner. And when I say thinner, um, this is what your book says, hair thinning. Um, it's not really just hair thinning. You actually cannot grow hair in entire patches on your scalp. Um, I have a, a old friend whose daughter has alopecia, and she can grow little tufts of hair in places but she cannot get a full head of hair. And this is a genetic condition. And then the last one is true baldness. True baldness is also a genetic condition. It is typically um, sex influenced. So we say it's typically X. So I'm not gonna go back over genetics and what an X-linked condition is. I'll mention it briefly, so just to jog your memory. So remember that women, um, our sex chromosomes are XX, and men, their sex chromosomes are XY. So what that means is that if there is a recessive genetic condition, um, if you see it on one of the X in a woman, then it's typically not expressed. But if it's carried on the X for the male, since there's only, since there's only one X, it's going to be expressed. So this is why we typically see it in men. It's carried by females. But it's expressed in males. Um, so this is why a lot of times people might say, you know, to a man, hey, to know if you're gonna be bald when you get older, look at your mom's side of the family because your mom would be the carrier of it. Then she would pass it to her sons and if her sons get that particular genetic condition attached to their X chromosome, they would express it. Okay. Um, so one type of true baldness is called male pattern baldness. Male pattern baldness, again, it is a genetic condition. It's an X-linked condition. And it actually causes the hair follicles to respond negatively to something called dihydroxytestosterone. Um, DHT, dihydroxytestosterone. Basically, testosterone. So a lot of times, um, usually we'll start seeing this in men in their early 20s. Um, and what happens is it's truly when they start producing more testosterone. The hair follicle sees the testosterone as something negative. It actually causes the hair follicle to drop the hair. Um, so as long as testosterone is present in the body, the hair follicle will drop the hair. It will not grow or regrow new hair. So there are some drugs, there are some ways that we can relieve male pattern baldness. Um, drugs that inhibit testosterone production. Now, if you ask a man, hey, you want me to turn off all your testosterone? Uh, let me tell you about the side effects. Um, you're not gonna have the same muscle mass um, and you're probably not gonna have a sex drive. I think most men would go, eh, no thanks, um, I'll just have no hair, I'll just shave my head, that's fine, don't worry about it. Um, so taking a drug that inhibits testosterone means that all the things that testosterone normally gives a man, which is the greater muscle mass, the lower voice, the pattern of hair all over the body, they wouldn't have that. 
And so this one, there's a lot of trade-offs with that particular drug. Another drug is called minoxidil. Now you've probably heard of Rogaine with minoxidil, right? Rogaine is that topical treatment that you put on your hair that helps you regrow your hair. Um, actually, minoxidil was originally invented as a blood pressure medication, but during clinical trials, people were coming back and reporting their findings, and most men were coming in going, yeah, yeah, blood pressure, but look, look, I have hair, and they actually discovered, hey, you know what, this does a better job at regrowing hair than it does with blood pressure, and so they had to rebrand and remarket this drug as something that could help regrow hair. And then the last one that's on here is finasteride. Finasteride is a pill that you take as a man, you would take this every day. And what the pill does is it actually sort of masks testosterone from the hair follicle. So it makes it so the hair follicle doesn't see the testosterone in your body. You're still making testosterone, it's still in your body, but now your hair follicles don't see it, so they're not gonna drop the hair. So this one is very promising, but you gotta take it every single day because if you forget one day, then your hair follicles see the testosterone and you start dropping your hair, right? So this one's kind of hard to remember to take every single day. So we've done glands, we have done hair. The last appendage I'm gonna walk you through is nails. So nails are basically scale-like modifications that we find um, covering the ends of our digits. So the ends of your fingers, ends of your toes. Um, they are modifications of the epidermis. And your nails are really hard. So remember, we've been talking about keratin. You've got keratin in your skin, you have keratin in your hair. You also have keratin in your nails, but it's a harder form of keratin, so it's more protective, right? So the whole point is that you have this nice protective covering at the ends of your fingers, at the ends of your appendages. Um, the parts of the nail that you need to know, these are, this is a very similar image to this, is found in the lab manual for this week, right? Um, and so some of the parts and pieces would be like the free edge of your nail. This is the part of your nail that you cut or file. The body of the nail, that's all the part that's sort of pink, that's connected to the tissue, the dermis underneath. The cuticle, right? Ladies, we know what the cuticle is. Um, the lateral nail fold, this is on the edges, so this is where you might get like a hangnail. My son complains of those all the time. They, they do hurt like the dickens. Then you also have something called the lunule. The lunule is that little white half moon shaped structure at the top of the nail. And so I always remember lunule and I think lunar, right? Moon, half moon. Um, a few other parts and pieces would be like the root of the nail, okay? And then you can also see the matrix of the nail. So that's all I'm going to mention about nails. Not a ton, just a little bit. 